Good morning, and I call this hearing of the Senate Communications and Technology Committee to order. And I would like to welcome everyone this morning. And today we will be discussing Senate Bill 482, sponsored by myself and Senator Ament. And this bill would do two major things. Uh, first, it would consolidate all state IT systems and strengthen our state cybersecurity systems. We have held several hearings on this bill in the past, and we wanted this hearing to be focused on various other states and how they have consolidated their IT systems and provided better cybersecurity. We know that the best way to do something is to hear from others and gain their perspectives and things that they have done successfully and things that they wish they could have done better. So uh, we know uh, firsthand about some of the failures that we've experienced here in our own Commonwealth with its IT systems, uh, the botched state police radio project, the unemployment compensation call centers, uh, DHS corrections, uh, the teacher information management system at the Department of Education, all have had data breaches which have exposed the names and personal information of thousands of individuals. Our Commonwealth has had challenges with the management of hundreds of millions of dollars and many projects remain incomplete. Too many times, government is the last to respond to IT-related issues, which often results in the waste of taxpayer dollars. I look forward to hearing from other states and learning how we might be able to implement some of their best practices when it comes to consolidating our state IT services. And I would now like to open it up to Chairman Kane for some opening remarks. Chairman Kane. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to everybody. And I appreciate everybody that's coming in today to, to give some testimony. This is, uh, this is all new to me, so uh, I, I, I look forward to hearing some of the testimony. I also believe that our, our constituents and our residents of the state of Pennsylvania, their, their information needs to be secure. Um, and I, I look forward to working with you on this bill. But I do know that Senate Bill 482 is a massive 54-page bill that seeks to consolidate information technology, operations, management services, and procurement from the Office of Administration and the Department of General Services to a new Office of Information and Technology. The bill is very prescriptive, and it lays out how each and every aspect of Commonwealth IT should be procured and managed. It is constant, IT is constantly changing. Cybersecurity threats change frequently. The bill has more maze and needs fewer shalls, so I'm looking to help amend some of that with you. They need flexibility to manage existing IT issues and cybersecurity threats, as well as issues and threats that may emerge in the days, weeks, months, and years to come. While we'll be receiving input from NACIO, the former CIO of Michigan, and the current CIO of Maine may be insightful and helpful experts, or I'm sorry, or may be helpful experts in IT say that every state's IT needs are different. So consolidation needs to be carefully considered. Colin said, Colin, consol oh boy. consolidation in one state may not make sense in another state. The type of consolidation we may vary from state to state. Each state has a unique needs and helps and should individually access their needs and adopt the programs, procedures, and software and hardware that works best for each and every one of them. Uh, I look forward to hearing some of the testimony. I probably will have some questions at the end. So thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman Kane. And I'd like to get things started here today with our first panel. And joining us is Doug Robinson, Executive Director of the National Association of State Chief Information Officers. Mr. Robinson, please proceed with your remarks. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Phillips Hill and members of the Communications and Technology Committee. And I certainly thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on information technology consolidation in the states. Uh, my name is Doug Robinson. I serve as Executive Director of the National Association of State Chief Information Officers, otherwise known as NASIO. And NASIO is the national association representing state CIOs of the 50 states territories in the District of Columbia. Uh, my appearance before the committee today is in the capacity of an interested party uh, to the discussion around state IT consolidation. Uh, and I will uh, have my remarks will be supported by survey data, uh, national reports and CIO insights. Uh, really for the, about the past 15 years, we've been looking at IT consolidation. So I have a lot of data today. I'm going to uh, share some of that. I believe you have copies of, uh, of a presentation with a lot of data. So I'll move through that quickly and then be prepared to, uh, to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Uh, so if you would uh, follow along, let me talk a little bit about the, the state IT landscape today. And uh, again, uh, as you'd expect, uh, cybersecurity is a prominent topic with the state CIOs, but uh, also a continuing trend around transitions within the state CIO office. And that's who we represent are the enterprise state CIOs. And I use the term enterprise, I mean the executive branch of state government. So those are our, our members and who we represent. Uh, so that's the remar my remarks today are clearly uh, uh, looking at from their viewpoint across the, uh, across the states. So we have continued to see uh, more consolidation and more transition going on, particularly with uh, the, the pandemic impact. We've seen a lot of uh, interest in moving more towards uh, transitions and optimization of the information technology environment. Uh, so that's certainly one of the other trends. And you can see some of the other views of the state IT landscape today, particularly elevated cyber threats during the pandemic. So we always have to be cognizant of that. The other uh, insight I'll provide is the movement of many states to what we have described as owner operator model, which has been the predominant model of state information technology for the last four decades to one of more of a CIO as broker. And by that, we mean that states are continuing to examine and implement uh, less technology that they own on premise or within, within the state government and more partnering with the private sector providers with cloud solutions and software as a service and things where they are now partners in the success of, of de delivering services to citizens. So that's definitely one, one of the areas that we're tracking and uh, that can have an impact on consolidation. Let me move on to the top 10 priorities of the, of the states. Each year since 2006, uh, we present a ballot to our state CIOs for them to rank their top 10 priorities. So this has given us some incredible longitudinal data since 2006 about the priorities of the state CIOs at that time. Uh, you have before you the 2021 top priorities. And as the Senator mentioned, cybersecurity is, is uh, front and center. It has been number one for eight consecutive years. So it's clearly something that CIOs need to remain focused on, you need to manage, you need to lead, and also to invest. Uh, but in that list, you will see a number seven consolidation and optimization. As I mentioned, this has been a longstanding priority of state CIOs. It was number one for a number of years. It's traditionally been in the top three or four, but as more and more states become consolidated and optimize their environment and begin to kind of what I'll call rationalize their investments in infrastructure and software with, with uh, networks, with telecom, with other services they provide, you can see uh, that consolidation and optimization is not the uh, preeminent priority that has been in the past, but it remains importantly uh, on the top 10 list. Let me move into some of my, our, our, our survey data and particularly to remark that uh, IT consolidation uh, from the CIO perspective is not new. Uh, it is difficult uh, and it has been, and in some cases it can take many, many years to have a successful consolidation. So we have a lot of national data. So I just wanted to point out that uh, this is a topic where many states uh, began to consolidate in the 1990s in one way or another. Some states started with data center consolidation where they may have had a multitude of data centers run by individual state agencies and they began to consolidate those. 
Uh, some began with uh, email and collaboration platforms. I was involved in projects in 1999 through 2002, which involved the consolidation in a state, particularly around servers and email. And again, that email was entirely consolidated for the executive branch in 2002. So these are initiatives uh, that you will see across many, many states. And so we have some good data uh, about that, particularly in our first national study, which you can see was in 2006. So again, I remarked that this is not new. And we have lots of findings at the national level about that. And we saw a trend then, uh, as remarked by our state CIOs in responding to that survey of an interest in consolidation and the beginning of of implementation plans and then execution over the next decade uh, in terms of consolidating the assets uh, of information technology across all executive branch agencies. I, I would like to cover what I will call kind of the spectrum of IT consolidation. Uh, my remark here is one I use very often in legislative testimony, which is if you've seen one state, you've seen one state. Uh, so you need to really examine uh, the individual characteristics of the state uh, the, the risk, uh, appetite for obviously for risk, but also in terms of the fiscal impact, uh, the fiscal commitment, the culture of the organizations, the resistance to change among the agencies, these all have to be examined because each of these, uh, as you navigate this map through consolidation, each state has taken a somewhat different path. But to generalize the view, I've provided you with kind of, a, again, a spectrum or continuum of consolidation. And uh, there's no state today that is completely decentralized. That certainly was a case in the past, but as you can see, states are moving toward a more consolidated model. Some have essentially found a sweet spot or an optimal model in that federated space where the CI organization provides a suite of services at the consolidated level, uh, but they may in fact then have agencies run particular applications that suit their business needs or have particular uh, areas of interest uh, that they can support. So again, there's a wide variety of approaches to this and you can see uh, there are some states today that do have a more decentralized model. But again, the, the, the continuum has been for the last uh, 20 years to move towards more consolidation. And there's some, there's some strong rationale behind that. So let me move if I could to, uh, to what we're seeing in terms of the last several years of the rationale for IT consolidation. And as already been mentioned, uh, certainly one that has come to the forefront in, in the last several years is the need for reducing risk, uh, particularly around those uh, cybersecurity threats and strengthening IT security. And through our many national studies on cybersecurity, uh, what we have seen, of course, is the challenges around individual agencies being able to provide enough resources to protect the assets of their state. And so that has resulted in you know, broad consolidation around both the technology, but also more importantly, just the governance and the policy and the investments around cybersecurity. And so we have seen more and more states move to a centralized cybersecurity posture, if you will, uh, with a core set of resources and disciplines and capabilities of those states to be able to deliver cybersecurity effectively and protect the assets of the state, both infrastructure uh, and, and data. And that's critical uh, to think about that today. So that's been a business driver, continues to be uh, enter enterprise integration and application integration is important. Uh, improving digital services for citizens, something that was clearly exposed and has been during the pandemic is the fragility of our, our delivery uh, systems uh, for citizens. And many, many states have had to really beef up their capabilities in, in that area. I think most importantly to look at uh, one of the areas that I think I always try to highlight is one of the challenges for states is when you look at cost and spend and you combine all of the, the, the assets, the, the states typically, one of their major challenges is that they have a high degree of diversity and complexity. So it isn't as much about consolidating the assets, it is reducing the diversity and complexity of the assets you already have on the ground. Now by those assets, I mean both the infrastructure, the hardware, the servers, but also your applications environment. Uh, you may have multiple applications within agencies that have, in fact are highly duplicative and do the same business function, uh, and, but they're, again, they're grown within each agency and you need to look at that and leverage that. So the applications portfolio and kind of maximizing the, the integration of that is, is critically, is critically important. Definitely one of the things CIOs look for in terms of uh, 
in terms of the consolidation is to reduce their overall operational cost. So again, I, I provide you some of that from our national studies and surveys, you know, asking the state CEO what was their rationale. If you move on, uh, I provided you a list of targets. These are again, highly generalized. These are typically targets for IT consolidation within the states. Uh, there, there's no rank order here. They're not from, from easy to hard or hard to easy, but these are ones that states often uh, target and particularly starting with uh, the data centers and the mainframes. We've seen that as a prominent target. Data center consolidation has been going on for many years. Uh, some states were fortunate and they started out with no dispersion of data centers, meaning there was no individual agencies running uh, data centers. It was actually immediately consolidated as a central IT function. Uh, most states operate in this fashion today where it's a chargeback function. So uh, that's that's common uh, to see some of those start. And clearly we've seen more consolidation and centralization around security and around uh, individual assets such as desktops, laptops, servers, other components of that infrastructure uh, across the board. And in some cases it can be much more difficult with individual business applications at the agencies to, to consolidate those. And just as a reference point, so although this is dated, I provided you a snapshot of IT consolidation, which uh, we captured in our 2016 national survey. We haven't looked at what this list since then, so I wanted to provide you at least what, what it looked like in terms of what the CIOs uh, commented on about what was done within their environment and what was, what was ongoing and what was planned. And so you can look at some of that data in terms of the list that I provided to see where states are. In some cases, in areas like telecommunications, uh, many states are, are much further along and added networking. They are in some of the other aspects that again, can be more uh, localized to individual agency business needs. So let me wrap up if I could with uh, just some, some comments coming from our, our surveys. Uh, that we've done over the past and our reports around consolidation. And again, those are all publicly available for you to take a look at. And I've sent some of those links to, uh, to staff. The challenges of IT consolidation initiatives, uh, first and foremost, I think over time, what we've seen is the recognition that you have to have, uh, you have to have funding to begin the transition. And we've also seen that in many cases that funding has been inadequate and it has not been sustained. And so that's been a, a common comment from our state CIOs is that, that, that some of these consolidation efforts that have been documented by a number of states uh, have taken five to seven years to, to move uh, from the agency owner operator model to one which is highly consolidated. So you have to be in it for the long haul and you have to provide that foundational funding to make the transition. Going back to my previous comment, you're gonna have a lot of diversity and complexity in those environments and that all has to be accommodated and you have to begin to rationalize that technology as you're moving it to a highly consolidated environment or more of a unified uh, model. So that's important. Uh, First and foremost, at, I would say in every survey that we've completed, the number one challenge to IT consolidation is the agency or workforce resistance to change. So this is discussion really around change management. Uh, the agencies will resist uh, the control function and they won't, will want to remain autonomous. Uh, and that's a challenge because they, they want to you know, continue to run their own environment. And so there has to be a lot of change management. These a technology, these discussions around uh, IT consolidation are quite frankly more about people and money than they are about technology. And so that's something you have to recognize that that's you know, resistance to change. And uh, over time, there will most likely be higher than projected transition costs. And you will wanna make critical decisions along the milestone path about what, when you make a move, whether or not that's appropriate for the current environment uh, that you have at the consolidated level you may have to delay that to be to make that preparation. So again, you have to lay, lay a strong foundation and a strong bed for that consolidation uh, movement. You know, let me end with a couple of things uh, that, that we have uh, documented in one of our playbooks, which is really around critical success factors for states that have consolidated at a very high level. Clearly executive support is critical and strong executive support from the governor's office to make sure that the message is clear to the, uh, to the agencies. Uh, we've seen consolidation in states that has been prompted by both executive order, uh, by both legislative and, you know, by codification and a statute, a bill was passed mandating consolidation. We've all seen very successful consolidations that had 
uh, no, no other motivation other than the leadership of the state CIO and the business leaders to recognize that they wanted to move towards a more consolidated environment and to re reduce some of their operational tension because there's always gonna have that, that tension in terms of the ability of the CIO uh, organization to deliver services. So again, each, each that perspective is different for, for every state. So I think a governance model is, 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 is particularly critical. Uh, there must be a shared decision-making model on all of this. And again, that's why some of this consolidation effort can take a number of years as we've seen across the states. As I mentioned, a sustained and predictable funding stream is critically important because many states have had to make pretty, pretty substantial investments to again, lay the groundwork, be prepared for the movement of, of both the infrastructure and the applications to a consolidated environment. It can take some time. And again, as I mentioned, people and money, uh, there will be challenges around workforce transition. There will be uh, some stress, there will be uncertainty, and many of the current IT workforce uh, will, will question you know, what's in it for them and what the impact on them is going to be. And so that can be an impediment uh, to the, the speed of the consolidation. So let me end, if I could, with just uh, some of the elements from our consolidation uh, data center consolidation playbook, which uh, we released several years ago. And again, uh, this are, these are insights from state CIOs who have been through, uh, through that consolidation effort. Uh, and we've seen states dramatically reduce uh, their data center footprint, which again can be a, a really uh, great uh, target for reducing your risk and also improving your, your cybersecurity posture is by looking at that particular opportunity in the, in the list of targets. But as you can see, a lot of things in the, uh, in the playbook that would be a straightforward project management, I would just call it, that you would have these activities, particularly making sure that you know what you have on the ground, documents or as is assets, and the implications of, of making that uh, making that transition. Again, I, I would reemphasize the governance model and also involving the agency stakeholders and having a change management activity, consistent messaging, uh, long term over over a long period of time because you're going to have changes perhaps in administration changes in agency leadership so they have to understand you know all of that and there's again some other items in there that uh, uh, I think that you could uh, you, you could you could see are, are very straightforward in terms of any large migration project I think most importantly is that uh, you have to manage expectations along the way and you certainly will have to expect surprises along the way because uh, as they begin the consolidation, the CIO organization may find surprises in the agencies. They may find major security vulnerabilities. They may find you know, lack of due diligence uh, around particular environments, both hardware and software. Those all have to be addressed. So you could expect to find surprises uh, during the consolidation journey. Uh, with that, uh, I appreciate your time today. I'd be glad to answer questions, and I'll end at, at, at this point, uh, Madam Chair, and I thank you for uh, your kind attention this morning with my remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. And um, I would now like to open it up for questions from members. Senator Dush. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the things that with the uh, consolidation is it can also it can got, kind of be a double-edged sword when you're uh, doing this uh, when you bring everything into one house uh, like with a hack or something like that uh, it, there's a possibility of taking down uh, everything if you have access to the one critical point what are some of the considerations that uh, you've seen the other states do to uh, protect against that? Well, it really, it gets to the, it's, it's the imposition of a very strong cybersecurity framework and a set of policies and operational disciplines. And I think that's, uh, as you mentioned, it, it, it's, a it's a balancing act. I think what most states have found that have, for example, policy or directives around security for their agencies, uh, that those aren't often uh, achieved. And so you have those actual exposures and those kind of frailties in the agencies 
currently today. So you have to look at how you're going to beef that up. There is obviously lots of conversation about what would be called kind of a monocultural approach or all the keys, you know, putting your eggs all in one basket in, in a consolidated or, or centralized model. Uh, but I think the states have, uh, I think over time, the states have understood that they have to then invest more in this consolidated model from a cybersecurity because they can achieve the consistency uh, across the board and the level of disciplines that they may not be able to achieve in the uh, in, in in the individual agency. So it's it's one of them. Either it's driving high levels of compliance and oversight and auditing at the agency level, or it's being able to do that in one consolidated environment. So again, every state has approached this differently. Uh, I want one observation from our data, which has certainly shifted in in over ten years. Uh, related to cloud services. But 10 years ago, when we asked states about, are they going to be adopting and moving to cloud services? The number one impediment was their concern about security. Uh, today, with the advent of rigorous cloud services, uh, rigorous frameworks, certification bodies, actually that become has become in 10 years, one of the major benefits and advantages of moving to the cloud, even off premise, even not within state government into public cloud, our CIOs are saying we're finding that that security rigor is actually better than what we're providing as a government because of the investments that are being made by these private firms. And so it's again, it, it, the, the, the continuing shift and continuing rate of change, but just the velocity of, of change uh, continues to provide uh, ad, advantageous platforms for securing more and more. So part of that is simply the again, governance and oversight, and it can be difficult in, in either model, quite frankly. Actually, you've gone down the roads where I wanted you to go. I'm glad to hear your answers. I'm a former uh, Chief of Information Protection for the Pennsylvania Air National Guard, and I think consolidating the training and uh, demanding the same level of training to the staff, because quite honestly, when it comes to the security, oftentimes it's the individual employee not being aware of some of the vulnerabilities and if everybody's uh, if you have excellent uh, information security uh, specialists conducting the training providing the training and it's universal I think it's uh, a good way to ensure that it's done right uh, how do they address the t uh, the retention of some of the more professional uh, people uh, in this environment that we have right now uh, how are the states uh, addressing that as a result of the cons uh, consolidation? Do you think it's easier when it's all, when it's basically consolidated, you can apply those types of assets to one specific or a, a smaller group of people that are responsible overall? Uh, that has been the experience of the states, yes, sir, is that uh, obviously recruiting and retaining uh, IT professionals in the public sector, particularly in state government is challenging. Uh, certainly uh, would be an understatement, but in the cybersecurity world, it's even more challenging with the current environment and with the uh, with the essentially zero unemployment, you're competing with the private sector and compensation levels. Uh, what states have been able to basically pitch is the fact that you have an opportunity to work in a very challenging environment and make a difference in terms of being a citizen, make a difference to taxpayers. Uh, if you are employed in that space. So, you know, many states are looking for opportunities, but they certainly are all moving toward that model of trying to kind of homogenize the training and also to adopt what we call whole of state. We talked about the guard, that's a component of that, where cybersecurity and protecting the assets of the state is everyone's responsibility. It's not just the chief security officer or someone in an agency that has security responsibility. So we're seeing again, more of that movement toward uh, unified training in some cases, in many states, uh, cybersecurity training is mandatory for all employees because they all have access to systems and data. But I think the whole of state model is going to be the predominant model in the future. It's evolving and it means basically involving not just the chief information officer, it's recognizing that cybersecurity is a business risk to the continuity of government. It's not about information technology, it's a business risk to the continuity of government. And that way, with that approach, you then can be very, very expansive uh, in terms of your, your training and requirements for, uh, for everyone. But our, again, our data and our experience would, would uh, point to 
the, the states that have been, again, more successful are moving to a more consolidated uh, and centralized cybersecurity environment, even if they don't do it for infrastructure, networks, applications. Cyber, again, as the top priority, has become an important target for consolidation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just one final comment. It's, I know there's, there are bidding awards when some people in, in this industry uh, announce that they're available. So the, t the top tier folks. So I know we've got a challenge in trying to hire such people. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dosh. Chairman Kane for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Mr. Robinson, thank you so much for sharing your information with us. And uh, it's interesting to hear about the survey and cybersecurity. I figured it had to be number one, but you also mentioned, you know, consolidation. And you, you also had said that it takes many, many years and that some states is, have taken different paths. Um, and is, is just, just on the IT and the cybersecurity end of it, on your, with the perspective of that, where does Pennsylvania actually rank? Are we top, bottom, middle? What's your thoughts on that? Senator, I appreciate the question. I get this quite often. And, and quite frankly, it is, it is not in, in my best interest or the interest of the association to, to rate or rank our states. Uh, so we, uh, we, don't, we, we don't get involved in, in that. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, for, as an, I guess, an, an evidence, an artifact, of Pennsylvania's uh, status uh, in the state, among the states. Uh, Pennsylvania has been a recipient uh, and a finalist in numerous NASIO uh, State Technology Recognition Awards uh, over the last 30 some years. We've been, we, we run the most prestigious awards program recognizing states. Uh, and uh, actually in 2019, uh, the Commonwealth was a recipient for their uh, shared services transformation with IT and HR. So uh, they are always in the discussion and, you know, always on the list when it comes to that. But when it gets down to actually rating and ranking, I would just point you back to my spectrum of it's really highly dependent on the state. Some states can have you know, excellent plans. They might have uh, very expansive statutory requirements and authorities. Uh, but that does not mean that they're going to be entirely successful over the long term. So again, it takes a lot of commitment. And I think you'll hear from some uh, CIOs and, and, and former CIOs today uh, around their individual experiences. But you will find that every state uh, takes differently. And, and some have, again, been able to use and leverage uh, legislation and statutory authority. Others have simply used the influence of the governor's office to move consolidation. Uh, without any formal uh, documentation or prompting. Thank you so much. I have no further questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Kane. And Mr. Robinson, um, my mom worked for a gentleman, Dr. Germanario, and one of his favorite sayings was, we may be good, but we can always be better. And so, it's very heartening to hear that Pennsylvania has been the recipient and finalist for um, many of the competitions that your esteemed organization puts forward. And I think there are some things that Pennsylvania does really well, obviously, um, our shared services model. Um, but I think there's also some room and, and opportunity for us to be better. In your opinion, um, could you talk to some things that you feel um, our Commonwealth could improve on uh, so that we again could be a finalist or a recipient of some of the awards that your organization puts forward? My remarks would be uh, very general, uh, Madam Chair, because I, I don't have the specific inside details around the Commonwealth's uh, information technology operation. Uh, I'm familiar with their, uh, their CIO organization at a highly general level. I can provide you general comments that I would provide uh, to, to all states and what I would call patterns of success. So we, I look at uh, across an, an N of 54 uh, organizations. And we say, what are the common patterns of success for these states that have advanced? 
Uh, part of that is enterprise leadership and governance. Uh, there's no doubt that that's a key aspect of that. Uh, another key part of that is enterprise architecture and uh, portfolio management, meaning that there is a roadmap for IT investments. Your architecture defines kind of your as is, what you technology you have, but what is your future? What, what are you going to move? What are you moving toward? And that will help with a set of standards uh, to, to inform uh, better procurements, but also to have uh, a knowledge. So having uh, the CIO organization, having visibility across all agencies and to, uh, their application portfolio, you begin to identify the, the significant amount of duplication uh, and redundancy around common lines of business functions. And this is not uh, commentary on the Commonwealth. This is typical across almost all states. And you can certainly find that from our CIOs today, that it's, it's a challenge is trying to identify um, that redundancy. Uh, we mentioned risk management, and I, I say risk management by not just cybersecurity, but one of the most significant risks across states is the lack of uh, project management and disciplined project management. As you mentioned uh, in your opening remarks, a, a number of projects. Uh, again, the, the postmortem on many state uh, information technology projects would find that those are related to either failed procurement acquisition problems at the start, uh, project management, lack of sustained funding, lack of, of discipline, lack of subject matter expertise. Very rarely is the technology the problem. Uh, we, I think most states and state CIOs would tell you that they have more technology than they need. There's more technology in the marketplace. So again, harmonizing and rationalizing that is important. So those are just a few. There's others that I can speak to, but I think you know we we capture those common patterns and say, why are states successful in certain areas? They all have kind of common, they have common attributes, and part of that is simply having, you know, a a plan forward about how they're going to govern their investments, and what authorities they have within the. Uh, within the individual agencies. And this is critical today for cybersecurity, most importantly, because that impacts, again, uh, a state government and their ability to respond successfully um, to that. So that's something to take a look at, but be glad to provide certainly the, the committee, you and the committee follow-up information about these. But again, that, 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 that's been typical for the last decade across, across the states. Mr. Robinson, we greatly appreciate your testimony here today and the opportunity to gain uh, better insight um, from someone who looks all across the nation at uh, cybersecurity practices and IT procurement practices of all of the states. So I thank you very much. And we're now going to have to move on to our next panel. So thank you again, Mr. Robinson. And joining us today for um, this part of the discussion is Dan Lorman. And Dan is the former CIO from the state of Michigan. And Mr. Lorman, you, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the opportunity to testify and, and thank you to the uh, Communication and Technology Committee for the opportunity. Uh, just to clarify, um, my background real quickly for those, those who don't know me, um, uh, I was an agency CIO, but I was not the statewide CIO. But just real quick background on myself, I was NSA, um, I was an NSA employee and starting my career. I was in uh, England with Lockheed and Mantec in the 90s. And then 1997, I joined Michigan government as an agency CIO with Department of Management and Budget. Uh, was a statewide CTO uh, for E-Michigan um, from 2000-2002, and then statewide CISO, first one in all 50 states um, uh, in 2002-2009, in to 2009. served as statewide CTO uh, from 2009 to 2011, and then uh, state CSO, which we'll discuss at the end, uh, physical and cybersecurity were merged together in Michigan as under one office, and I held that position until the end of 2014. Currently work for a company called Security Mentor out of Monterey, California. Um, so, um, if I could share my screen, is that I understand that's available? So, is that is that correct? Yes, that um, is available. Um, post disabled. It said it's giving me disabled participation screen sharing. So, I guess I'm going to need somebody to enable me to do that. Um, Hold one moment 
we'll okay. make sure that, that you have that ability. Thank you. Um, well, the presentation I'm gonna share, I'm gonna go through quickly is one that actually um, was a presentation that was given as a NASIO award in 2011. So 10 years ago, Doug Robinson talked a lot about um, you know, the different uh, history and I echo so many of his comments were like, yes, 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 because Doug's not only a great national leader, but he's also a, uh, still, I'm still getting disabled uh, screen sharing here, sorry. Um, but uh, many of my comments are uh, regarding that. Um, ah, there we go, it just allowed me to do it. Very Hopefully good. All, so can you all see that screen Fantastic. now? Yes, yes. Great. Okay, thank you. Glad the technology is working. Um, so this is, I won't focus on the first, I'm gonna fly through these slides very quickly, uh, but really talk about Michigan's um, consolidation journey. And really I was involved when, you know, we were decentralized, um, when we came back together and kind of walk you through the timeline, which, which I present. Again, my focus is on the Michigan journey and, and um, you know, really what happened uh, during the 17 years I was in Michigan government, but you know, really uh, all, all the different things we learned along the way and some of the advantages. I just want to echo right out of the gate that, you know, the advantages, certainly there are financial advantages, um, but there are more around issues like cybersecurity, better service, um, you know, on time, on budget projects, and a whole laundry list of other benefits that we saw during our consolidation journey in Michigan. Um, this is a very high level, you know, and the, and the picture on the on the side kind of shows from our mainframe consolidation in 95, actually before I joined the now at the end of storage virtualization was in 20, uh, 2011, so again, a decade ago, but, um, and there's been more things that have actually obviously happened. I can talk briefly about those through 2014, and then I left government, so I'm gonna not focus on that part of it after 2015, but really uh, talk about data warehousing, um, bringing all the employees together. I uh, just wanna mention in 2001, under the executive order 2001-3, created the Department of Information Technology um, in an effort to achieve a unified, more cost-effective approach for managing information technology. This was Governor John Engler, who was Republican, um, was able to be accomplished by streamlining, coordinating IT policy decisions across the enterprise. And yet many of them would em emphasize, this is really a bipartisan, um, nonpartisan issue for us. In Michigan, uh, Governor Granholm, who's now the uh, U.S. Uh, Energy Secretary under the Biden administration, became governor um, in 03, and she actually strengthened many of the provisions and, and continued on the policies. And then we went to, uh, in 20, 2010, um, Governor Rick Snyder was elected, um, certainly continued that um, in 2011 through his eight years as governor. And now Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who's a Democrat, have gone back and forth, a Democrat, Republican, have really um, you know continued this policy and, and process and the executive orders in place. And, and then a 20, I just mentioned quickly, 2009-55 uh, executive order um, issued in, on December 30th, 2009, effective March 21, 2010, abolished DIT and actually merged it, created the Department of, of Technology Management and Budget. So it brought all that was in MDIT together with Management and Budget as one department in Michigan. But really, um, so what was the scope of that? We consolidated 40 data centers. Um, down to three, then that went down to two later, uh, closed 37, um, savings are shown there. Um, you see some of the ROI involved, 30,000 square feet of floor space. Again, this was, this was a 2011, uh, these are 2011 numbers. Um, improved privacy, 4.4 petabytes at the time. I'm sure they're much, much, I know they're much, much more than that even today. Um, and then operations and control. Um, scope of the problem, you can see again, the number of servers, uh, the number of staff, personal computers, contractors, um, uh, disaster recovery plans is really the focus of this presentation, but how can we better respond to critical emergencies, whether they be, you know, power outage because of ice storms, you know, all hazards, whether that be cyber emergency, a ransomware attack, whatever it might be, um, really how do you, how do you um, basically uh, respond to that? How do you build plans? How do you, how do you really um, have a whole, as, as, as Doug Robinson mentioned, whole of government approach to these um, items? We did see um, during those six years, again, from you know, 05 to 11, um, some, some pretty dramatic uh, rates dropping, and that was largely accomplished by you know, allowing the kinds of things that Doug Robinson talked about in his testimony, which is really standardization, um, reducing the number of different types of email servers, the number of, of, of software applications being used, 
um, bringing together and getting um, uh, discounts related to things like storage and uh, a, a wide variety of, of technology services. So we did see some dramatic reductions. Um, overall, 100 million reduction IT spend based on 2001 employee consolidation. I will say one thing that happened um, in Michigan during these years was we did two early outs. We were in a very difficult financial time and there were a lot of employee uh, reductions. Um, you know, Doug Robinson mentioned resistance to change as being a top um, item. Just jotted down some notes while he was talking and I thought he, he wait, you know, went through a number of really great points um, around that. And one of the things that we had in Michigan was because a lot of people left in early outs and we actually reduced the number of employees during that time, um, some of that reduction and kind of quote, quote unquote turf battles were not there as much because agencies didn't often have the staff, the IT staff, they had lost a lot of staff, but by bringing them together, there was a, an, an ability to actually um, leverage resources, have more backup staff, have different organizations, maybe working on the same type of databases, the same kind of hardware, software systems, work together in, in, in team methods and actually have a, um, an effect of, of better use of resources really across the enterprise. Um, so really, uh, Michigan's government cloud, you know, this was again a focus, you know, it's, it's, it's evolved now as a hybrid cloud. I know use a lot of, um, uh, you know, public services like AWS and Microsoft, um, O365 and other things today. But, you know, really talk about data center information, telecommunications, really bringing together all of them um, and saying, how can we be prepared and, and ready to, to respond? Um, so again, some numbers here, um, just looking at the number of threats. I mean, I think we all know the cyber threats have just exploded even more. Um, I've been focused on cybersecurity 30 years plus of my career, and obviously received many, many times more threats even today, but we were starting to see that at that time, and cybersecurity was a top priority, and really bringing together one cyber team, which I managed and led, and I led the, the infrastructure and data centers, and then back to bringing physical and cybersecurity together under one organization in Michigan from 11 to 14, really created a much stronger cybersecurity platform enabling us to do a lot of things like the Michigan Cyber Disruption Strategy, um, which was an award-winning NASIO program, uh, Michigan Cyber Civilian Corps, uh, Michigan Cyber Range, which has been used by a number of other states. So that's where we test and we um, practice uh, different types of, of different scenarios around cyber emergencies. So all of that was really in place um, because of the leveraging and, and bringing together the consolidation. So, you know, we all know what are those failures that we face, you know, hardware failures, computer viruses, hackers, infrastructure changes, application changes, identity theft, and there's many, many more. Ransomware would be on this list today. Again, this is an actual presentation that was given, so I'm just going through it quickly. But really looking at that infrastructure and how we can provide those services in a more cost-effective, but in a, in a more re, uh, redundant, resilient way that really is more effective for citizens. And uh, so we use ITIL um, platform, you know, one of the big things I, I would highlight, I know we had a video, I can't show that today, but uh, we were really proud of at the time, as they still do today, even a decade later, is a day start call, which really looking at kind of headline news for government, I call it, um, but really what's going on across the enterprise, make sure the resources are available and can attack any issues or challenges, incidents that are especially um, important to, to, to the operation of running the business of government. Um, enterprise event monitoring, service availability, having criticality of data, really looking at that across uh, different agencies. Um, and so significance, you know, really we talked about um, processes, um, you know, new opportunities. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that today, but really working, partnering with local partners, partnering with the federal government, partnering with others um, that we work with in the private sector and nonprofits to provide um, voices in different areas that can really speak for government, which was really important. I, I totally agree with Doug. It's all about people, process, and technology, and the hardest of the processes and the people part are much more than the technology, but really having that standard approach was something that we did. Um, Governor Granholm mandated agencies plan for the con continu uh, continuation of government in the event of emergencies. Um, we've had a number of, we had the Northeast power outage, we had um, um, audit reports really looking at how we can strengthen um, and, and, and improve, um, you know, different aspects and really being able to handle that as a central organization. I think we were able um, to respond. Uh, for example, one quick story, I'll say that, you know, we, we learned a lot from that power outage. 
um, got, we're able to get uh, grant funds as an enterprise. Um, this first slide just showed those wiring and then really be able to fix a lot of those data centers that we closed were really more nothing more than glorified broom closets that were not effective and um, didn't have didn't have backup generators. So we were able to get funding uh, from FEMA grants, be able to put those in place. And then the next year we had a big ice storm and uh, knocked out Lansing, but um, because we had those generators running and those core data centers, we were able to really run um, enterprise, you know, really in Detroit and all over the state of Michigan, up in the UP and everywhere else because of the, the um, efficiencies and the things that we learned to be able to make sure that the things we did consolidate, we did better is really what it come down, comes down to. Those data centers had generators in place. So what were the processes? I'm going to quickly fly through this. I know we only have limited time here today, but um, go through this quickly. We had three phases. Assessments, as you know, Doug said, know what, know what you've got. Uh, find the path of reliability, resiliency, and recoverability. Transform the delivery models. Um, know where your data is, being able to really classify that data and, and do that effectively. So I'm not going to walk through these. I know these slides are available. Uh, Ms. Uh, Madeira has these slides, so you guys can, can hopefully you have these and you can look at these. But we talked about uh, building a red-green scorecard for applications, um, you know, yellow, and, and really knowing where things are at, knowing where critical apps are at. Um, being able to check that every day, making sure that we have a, a, a single pane of glass that we can view that across government. Um, finding the path, you know, gathering the data, correlating the business requirements. We develop strategies and costs to strengthen the application capacity for that resiliency and redundancy. And not having to do that, you know, in Michigan, again, speaking for our situation 20 times, but really being able to say we do this, we do it right once, and we make sure we integrate those systems. So they're not all running different versions of software. They're not all running different versions of operating systems, you know, for these critical systems especially, but also for desktops, for mobile devices, et cetera. Um, and then uh, third transform delivery model, um, really, you know, looking at a continuity plan, um, templates were built, uh, communication tools, service criticality was defined. Um, and it's, it becomes clear what I mean by some of this when I show the next slide, which really, um, well, we see some of the goals here, policy staffing models for continuity of service. Um, Again, this, this, this award was specifically figured on disaster recovery and, um, and, and you know, really responding to emergencies, but really this applied across all of our critical IT services. The same model was used because it's, you know, it's an ITIL model that was effective for business continuity and also for running day-to-day -day, you know, government. But um, this is a quote from Michigan Governor Granholm, um, who's, like I said, now the Energy Secretary. Michigan has practically taken steps to ensure critical and essential government functions continue to event of an emergency. This project has enhanced public safety while saving millions of dollars. It'll be a national model for reducing risk associated with information technology consolidation and shared services. Um, go through some significance here. Agencies expect that IT will deliver services to business customers. You know, Doug mentioned that relationship with the business areas is so key. Having, you know, um, really good uh, communication, uh, helping people understand, you know, that the centralized organization can really work together as a business partner um, and, and building that trust. I mean, that's so important. Um, I wanted to show this card here. Uh, we call it the Michigan Red Card. This is April 2010, um, but I know they still use it today. They update this. You know, what are the most critical systems? Where are the statuses? And they have their day start call. You know, what's what's up, what's down? Where do the resources need to go? Really understanding, you know, across an enterprise in many, many ways like like someone like a, in the private sector, an AWS or a Microsoft would think about, you know, is 0365 down for the East Coast or the, you know, mid, mid United States or something. Obviously that would impact numerous customers. Really that's kind of the approach we use with the red card using ITIL and really thinking about um, uh, funding for the project and really looking at um, how we can make sure that uh, business critical systems were up and operational. And then when we did have an outage, you know, God forbid that happened, we had a restoration priority, like what comes first, what comes second, those kinds of things. Um, so I think at that, I'm just going to go ahead and stop sharing and uh, just want to close with one final thought and just say that, um, you know, the journey continues. I think Doug, Doug really did, um, you know, I know you're going to hear from a current CIO, um, and, and, and Doug talked about current trends in the last, you know, five years. 
Um, I know I, I can't speak for the current administration. I'm not in the current administration in Michigan, uh, but I, I will say that you know the fact that this really was across Republican, Democrat, Republican, now Democrat, and they use the same model. It can be a bipartisan issue. It can be something that is done with best practices and it can really bring value um, both from uh, financial benefit, but also it can bring value um, to the services offered to the citizens. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Mr. Lerman, thank you so much. Um, if I could, just ask you to hold on a few minutes um, and we'll hear from uh, the current CIO from the great state of Utah um, and then uh, open things up for questions. I know our members have a lot of questions. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Very good, thank you very much. And with that, uh, welcome to Alan Fuller, who is the current CIO from Utah. And uh, Mr. Fuller, I'd like to turn it over to you for your testimony, followed by any questions from our members for you and Mr. Lorman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for this opportunity to present. Can I just confirm that you can see my slides? Yes, we can. Thank you. And do, uh, do we have a hard stop on the hour or can, how many minutes can I share with you? Well, um, right now I'm on leave from the floor. We're, we're getting uh, ready to begin our session. So um, the uh, Reader's Digest annotated version would be appreciated. Okay, terrific. Very I'll be good, very thank you. My remarks, thank you. I'm, uh, I'll just mention briefly then that in the state of Utah, we have a, a full service IT organization that serves the needs of the executive branches of the government, those that roll up to cabinet members and the governor. We don't serve the legislature, the courts, or higher education. So we're consolidated, but consolidated for the agencies, not, for, uh, not across all of the, the state government. We were consolidated in, uh, by House Bill 109 back in 2005, and this consolidated all of the IT services, uh, network, government, uh, sorry, network hosting, application, IT support, all of that. And the, the legislation that passed that also gave us, gave the CIO, uh, created the Department of Technology Services and established the CIO as that director. It also required the approval of all technology procurement to go through the chief information officer. The department is funded by an internal service fund. So the agencies have the budget and the IT organization bills the agencies for services. It required executive branch agencies to subscribe to the services of the department and it permitted branches of government outside of the executive agencies to use it as needed. I'll just mention that the, the consolidation was significant from 26, um, so I'm sorry, from 35 data centers down to two, and uh, there was consolidation of employees. There was significant benefit achieved in terms of things like enterprise application su support. Prior to consolidation, there was over 90 employees doing email in all the various branches of agencies, and, and uh, afterwards there was a single digit number, like five. There was significant consolidation in procurement and in infrastructure, the cybersecurity and, and enterprise information was substantial. There was a, a lot of benefits that we saw in terms of, of consolidation. The, the uh, physical servers were substantially reduced, the number of data centers were substantially reduced, and there were there was an also an increase in performance. Um, we have a uh, CPA audited results of $79 million in savings to the state. And we've since uh, further consolidated the Department of D Technology Services was consolidated into a division of technology, became the Division of Technology Services part of the Department of Government Operations. And that was a consolidation of technology services or IT and HR and administrative services. I've given you a, a super quick flyby. I think uh, I will just note that um, two, two quick things about our consolidation process. One, there's a feeling in the state overall that it's been extremely effective. There's uh, been significant cost savings. I would also mention that there is a continuing process of consolidation across applications. And there is always a little bit of a 
tension, I would say, between the agencies which have the budget and the IT uh, organization which provides the services. Uh, in most cases, we work together very well, but there's always, um, the, the agencies still have a very big say in how their technology dollars are spent. And, but overall, having a central IT organization has been very effective in, in consolidating costs and delivering better performance. Madam Chair, I'll stop my, my comments right there. I'm happy to take any questions the committee may have, and I'm delighted to be with you today. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. I'd like to turn it over to Chairman Kane for questions. I'd like to thank both of you for, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Lorman and also Mr. Four, go Utes, go, uh, go, go, go Blue. Um, thank you. Big fans of both teams. The, um, my, my question really is, did, uh, and I think Mr. Fuller, if I'm not mistaken, I did hear that, that it did pass legislation in uh, Utah. Uh, Mr. Lorman, did it, did it go through legislation also? It was exec executive order. Okay, was it executive order? Okay, um, and that's the only question I wanted to find out if it did have to go through legislation, so thank you. Senator Kane, I would just mention that in Utah, there was, uh, Governor Levitt um, was trying to move to consolidation by an executive order and received a lot of pushback and it was not successful. Ultimately, it was the action of the legislature that made the consolidation successful. Thank you so much. That's all I have, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Kane. And despite our partisan differences, we are. <laughs> <laughs> that state, uh, I know. You got it. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, again, Mr. Lorman, Mr. Fuller, thank you so much for being with us. And um, Mr. Fuller, you spoke about House Bill uh, 109 in 2005, where the legislation consolidated all IT procurement through the chief information officer. So in Pennsylvania, um, our uh, chief information officer, our chief information security officer are housed in the office of administration, um, but all IT procurement goes through uh, the Department of General Services where procurement for everything from paper clips to servers and, and everything else in between is done. Um, what did you find to be the advantages of consolidating your procurement under your CIO? Thank you, and let me clarify, we do have a procurement office and all procurement goes through them, but any IT procurement, any IT specific procurement, whether it's application or server or network or hosting or any of those things, if it's IT specific, then it, needs, then it has to be routed through the CIO as well for approval. And basically that allows the CIO an opportunity to, um, uh, to, to approve or in so, some cases advise that uh, a better purchase is, is uh, needed for the state. For example, with our email services, um, prior to consolidation, we had numerous different email services, which was expensive and redundant and overlapping. And that's, uh, I think the email and productivity suite is a, is a great example of where with a consolidation, the CIO was able to say, look, and this would have been my predecessors, the CIO was able to say, we, we need to consolidate to, to a single uh, email system. And uh, so an email system was chosen and, uh, and it's been uh, uh, dramatically more efficient for the state. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lorman, um, I, I wanted to say to you, uh, you referenced a video that you thought would be very helpful for us <laughs> to, to view. Um, if you would like to send it to us, send it to Ms. Mandera. Um, sure. We will make sure that it is distributed to all the members of the committee um, sure. for, for them to view. Um, that would be appreciated. I guess you you spoke to this. Um, you you sort of laid out what the challenges were in Michigan when you went through that process of consolidation, and and you spoke um, to to the benefits. Can can you 
further delve into what the benefits were of consolidation, my sense from, from your testimony and, and from um, Mr. Robinson and Mr. Fuller is that with consolidation uh, came increased cybersecurity as well. Um, can, can you speak to how that happened in your states? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, I mean, in so many ways. I mean, we, we, you know, as Doug mentioned in his testimony, um, in Michigan, we had a very uh, different policies in each agency around a whole series of different topics. So at, at a very basic level, um, a consolidated, you, know, you can go to literally, go to, still today, go to michigan.gov forward slash PC policy and see the acceptable use policy for all state employees. Prior to this consolidation, everyone had their own policy. And so, you know, obviously you could pol do policies together centrally and not do that, but, but that played out in so many different ways. You know, policies around how you secure servers, around how you have standards um, for different types of, um, you know, different versions of, of, of software operating systems, um, you know, consolidation of the number of systems and so then when you get down from maybe 10 to five to one um, in the email, you know, literally we had in some cases hundreds and, and it could have the same type of email, but it would be a, a different versions um, of the same, you know, same, you know, run by different departments and different divisions, different websites, all of those were all different. And so by bringing them together um, now, okay, down to one or two or a handful, have the expertise on our cyber team to really make sure that we're doing all of the best practices um, which, quite frankly, were not being done by the individual agencies in Michigan. And so, you know, having the expertise, um, being able to apply that, um, being able to have a team. I, you know, I did, one thing I didn't hear mentioned yet is, is, and it's actually not in the slides, but working in partnership with the with Department of Homeland Security, CISA would be today, um, but working with the MSI SAC, working with um, our, our private sector partners, really from a relationship perspective and really having, I don't want to say a single voice because it would not always be one person, but really like in our cyber team when I was CISO, being able to really look at um, issues from an enterprise perspective and representing, you know, by the way, I'm an MSU football fan, not a Michigan fan, so I don't say go blue, I say go green, go white, but we will be playing Penn State the last game of the season. Uh, but I'll just throw that out. It's like, you don't want to have, you know, defensive coordinator, I mean, yeah, you have different roles. You have the defense, you have the offense, you got the head coach, but you know, one head coach, right? Um, and you got a good head coach at Penn State. So, I mean, but it's one team working together as one goal. And, and I think, you know, if it, you know, in many cases, I would say in Michigan, we had 27 teams and, and it was, they were all kind of doing their own thing. They had their own offensive coordinators, their own defensive coordinators, and they were really, you know, and in many cases they were doing good stuff. In some cases, not so much. Um, but we, you know, being able from a cybersecurity perspective to really um, get that threat intelligence, to really be able to partner on real-time response, to be able to prepare, you know, statewide for emergencies, tabletop exercises, being able to know when, when, a, when a ransomware attack hits or, you know, really getting to the point where I know Michigan today, North Carolina, other states in a centralized model can actually go out and help the counties. And again, I don't know if Pennsylvania is doing that or not, but, but the reality of, you know, to the point where um, th that expertise was in an organization and, and when there were, you know, clear holes that needed to be filled, bringing in um, partners from the private sector, bringing in expertise, um, but not having to do that 27 times, you know, right? You know, and, and knowing that, you know, you're really a single face. Um, I'll stop there, I could go on, but, you know, there's a lot of ways that by having one team in cybersecurity and partnering with those, having a good partner relationship with the business area, you can really be much, much more effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I will tell you, Mr. Lorman, I actually have ransomware legislation that talks about our state uh, technology folks helping our counties, our municipalities, our school districts, because you're right, we, we have more expertise than some of our smaller uh, jurisdictions of, of government. And so that is definitely uh, important and something that we are looking forward to working on in this committee. Um, Mr. Fuller, do you have anything that you can add to, to that yes, response? Yes, please. Thank yes, you. Yes, please. First, first, first of all, I, I wholeheartedly support Mr. Lorman's comments. They're an absolute sink there. 
So in, in the state of Utah, the chief information security officer is on my staff, so it's consolidated as well as the, the IT organization. We, we all have to recognize and, and just internalize that we live in a very dangerous world and our systems are constantly under attack. And therefore, we have to be very committed and very diligent in our discipline to protect those critical systems and provide the continuity to the government. Um, I, I, would, uh, I, I would just say that, uh, so in the state of Utah, we, our chief information security officer and our cybersecurity staff cover all of the agencies and are able to set and maintain very strong policies and our, our agencies love that service because they know that it's so important to them and we do reach out to cities and counties and, and towns in the state and help support them to some degree i would say that um, um you know i would just uh, strongly encourage uh, uh, my beloved pennsylvania i say mine because i lived in pennsylvania for two years while i did my uh, graduate work at the Wart business school so i lived in Bryn Mawr, pennsylvania and then um, so I have a real close tie to the state still. Um, I just strongly encourage you, regardless of what you do with your IT infrastructure, I just really strongly encourage you to centralize your information teams and, and infrastructure because uh, the, the, the expertise needed and the relationships with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Homeland Security, your state public safety, your state um, state bureaus investigation the national guard comes into play it's just really going to be difficult to maintain the level of security you need with a fragmented approach thank you very much and um, this question really is for either of you um, but we are in a time when we have been struggling with how and who and when to respond to the various emergencies that have, have popped up, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And can you talk about the steps that, that your states have taken um, with regard to the changes that they have made in terms of IT during the pandemic? Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I'll take that first. Uh, Please. So with the with the onset of COVID, the the IT organization had to pivot very quickly to uh, from from a model of supporting people in buildings and on campuses to a model of supporting Utah's approximately twenty three thousand employees, nearly nearly all working from home, and doing it at the same time that the IT staff are moved to working remotely, and so. We're really, really proud of the, the, the organization's ability to, to make that pivot and make that, that focus change. I do feel that having a consolidated IT organization made that much better because there's able to be a unity of direction, a unity of purpose in making that switch. And, you know, I, I won't uh, sugarcoat the fact that there was significant effort required from the teams to to support those rapid changes brought on by the pandemic. But, but ultimately we were very successful in making the network changes needed, making the support model changes needed for things like desktop and application support. And so we, we were able to pivot very quickly um, and in those extreme circumstances to be able to, to change our support model for the employees of the state. So when Utah brought on uh, new services, added new programs, you know, here in Pennsylvania, we had to make changes to our unemployment compensation system, um, brought on new programs like uh, COVID-19 contact tracing, all of those types of things that we had to do from an IT perspective in state government um, were those things vetted through your office and did the CIO um, and your team, you being the CIO, um, have input and, and provide guidance and assistance to departments as they brought on these IT systems? Of course, you know, many of us were, 
working from home, educating from home, receiving health care from home, interacting with our government from home. Yes, absolutely. So uh, all of the things you just mentioned were very similar problems faced and very similar challenges that we faced in Utah. And so the, uh, the way it was managed in the state of Utah is the, the governor's office had a task force and, and uh, uh, the IT organization, the central IT organization was included in that task force, as well as of course, Department of Health, Department of Human Services, Public Safety, other agencies that have critical role to play in, in the public health space. So the, the, way that, the way that worked was that the IT organization was brought in and, and we did in fact play a critical role in bringing up coronavirus.utah.com, vaccinate, sorry, .gov, vaccinate.utah.gov, uh, the, the, the critical communication pieces that helped the state through the pandemic. So the, the IT organization was considered um, just a, a member of the task force and a key member in developing the technology solutions to in, in partnership with health, in partnership with other agencies to deliver what we needed for the state. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very helpful conversation. Really appreciate um, your input as we have this conversation here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, again, knowing that we might be good, but we can always be better. Your, your testimony has been exceedingly helpful. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this part of the discussion. And I will now recess the Senate Communications and Technology Committee until the call of the chair. Thank you very much.